This is Dr. Ted Hildebrand teaching Old Testament history, literature, and theology, lecture number six on genealogy not equal to chronology, the image of God, and the two trees in the Garden of Eden. Dr. Hildebrandt. Uh, for this week, you guys are working on Exodus. Exodus, okay, and you have to read like the first, is it 22, three chapters or something, up through the Ten Commandments, and then there's, after that, it's select chapters and things, so you don't have to read the whole thing. Uh, basically, you're skipping a lot of the tabernacle descriptions and things like that. There's two articles this week. One is by a guy named Bruce Walkey, who's kind of a super scholar, on kind of the archaeological evidence from Palestine of the uh, coming in under Joshua and things. And so I think you'll find that interesting. Now, what I want, now this is important because there's two articles this week. One article that you're going to be responsible for. The other one, I'm simply going to ask you, did you read the Walkey article? I'm not going to ask you details from the Walkey article. Okay, there's a lot of details there. I'm just going to ask you whether you read it. I want you to go through and read it. Now, on the Bloody, blo the Bloody Bridegroom article, that's the one I want you to focus on, okay? The Bloody Bridegroom, okay? So that one I will ask you specific questions about. And then you had a question? Okay. So the bloody bridegroom, focus on that one. The other one, just read. And then the things of Genesis, there's a, a couple memory verses. I think the memory verses are real hard. Uh, what is this? Psalm 23. I think it starts out, uh, the Lord is my shepherd. You may have heard it a few times. So I, I want you to know the Lord is my shepherd. Uh, by the way, um, that's a really important psalm. Um, and you should know that. Uh, it comes in really handy. I thought, well, it just it's, it's a very good psalm to learn. So... Okay, any questions? We're oh, one other thing on the, uh, the 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 materials for this course. We're up to twenty dollars now. Some of you still have not paid for the materials for the course, and so it's twenty bucks now. I don't want to chase down for after Friday. After Friday, you're done taking quizzes and exams. You gotta you gotta have it in, or it starts cutting into your. You know, you can't take the quizzes and can't take the exams. So you need to get it in this week. It's not an option. So, okay, but. Um, all right, let's open with a word of prayer, and then we'll uh, dive in the book of Genesis today and get down the road. Father, we thank you for your kindness to us, and we thank you for the beauty that comes to us in, in falls in New England, the refreshing weather, and we just thank you for that. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you've spoken, you've had it written down, and now you give us the privilege of being reading it. We pray that you might help us as we try to interpret it, that we might understand it aright, we pray that it might guide us to you, to glorify and honor you, to worship you more accurately, and to appreciate your Son, whom you gave on our behalf, much more. So help us in our explorations in your word today. We thank you that we can call you Father, even this day. In Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. Okay, uh, we want to start up uh, by asking the question, how old does the Bible say the earth is? Now, we've been discussing this quite a bit, and the answer to that is where, is, where in the Bible does it say how old the earth is? There's no verse anywhere in the Bible that says exactly how old the earth is. So you've got to ask yourself some questions then about how much of a big deal you're going to make of this, and as this hopefully comes up here, um, we want to start off by saying, if the Bible doesn't say specifically how old the earth is, you have to be careful about making that a test of orthodoxy. Now, what I mean by test of orthodoxy is, how should I say, are you going to split churches over this issue of how old the earth is? Now, by the way, have some churches split over that. Is that the wrong issue? It's the wrong issue because pe different people are going to have different opinions and it's only their opinions because the Bible doesn't tell us how old the earth is. So I want to say the age of the earth should not be a test of orthodoxy. should not be a test since it doesn't say. There's not one clear verse in the Bible that says how old the earth is. It's all conjecture. Now you can have your own conjectures. You can have all your reasons you want, but it's still conjecture. You don't have a thus saith the Lord on this one. So you've got to back off and realize, can your own conjectures be wrong? Can your own conjectures be wrong? I said your own conjectures can be wrong. Okay. And I'm joking, of course, because I'll show you things in the next class period where I've changed my opinion over the years. I've changed how I thought about things. Okay, So it, be careful about that. 
Here is an example. I put up some examples of people. You've got to be careful about pushing science into and grabbing science out of the Bible. You've got to be careful about pushing science into or out of the Bible. Here are some examples. I think we mentioned some of these last time, right? The poison in Psalm 104, verse 3. Psalm 104 is a beautiful, if you love animals, if you love animals, Psalm 104 is your psalm, okay? If you love animals, good, good animal. But anyways, it talks about the poison of asps being under its tongue. The poison of asps being under its tongue. Now, serpents and snakes, asps and stuff, when a rattlesnake bites you, is it because the poison is under its tongue or is the poison in the fangs? It's in the fangs, okay? So this is a poetic description. It's not, is this meant to be taken? Say, oh, well, the ass, they've got special poison under their tongue. That's not the point, okay? It's, it's not the point. So you've got to be careful about pushing science into or out of the Bible. This is a poetic description. I'm going to ask, but it's not meant to be taken as, you know, a scientific description. Here in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 12, it talks about the four corners of the earth. And again, you can't say, well, okay, they all held to a flat earth, so therefore the Bible teaches a flat earth. You're getting the wrong point. It's just saying what? All over the earth, the four corners of the earth. And by the way, even in the 21st century, do we talk about the four corners of the earth? People came from the four corners of the earth to go to, to New York City for 9-11, okay, from the four corners of the earth. All we're talking about is north, south, east, west. We're not making a statement that the earth is flat. So you've got to be careful with that. Job, Job 9.6 talks about the pillars of the earth. Again, it's not a description. It's not, you know, this is electromagnetic description of how the earth is balanced. It's, Job doesn't know about electromagnetism. When he talks about, it's just a poetic way of, of saying the earth is stable. It's set on pillars. So you've got to be careful about taking some of this stuff and pushing science into the Bible or science out of the Bible and stuff. Eric, do you have a question? Okay, now the sun stands still. We're going to have to talk about that. Joshua chapter 10 and things. I, the problem there is understanding what it means by stand still. The word there actually means silent, and so we're going to have to, we're going to, have to talk about that. And I'm not, how should I say, I'll deal with that when we get to the book of Joshua, but he's about uh, three weeks ahead of me here. So, okay, now. My point is major on the majors, minor on the minors. The, the age of the earth is a minor point. Don't major on that. And, and then check your attitude. When somebody disagrees with you, are you able to handle disagreements? You know what I'm saying? And, and, and this is really important. How do you pe treat people when you disagree with them on some of these theological points? Now, this is another big point. Genealogy. How do some people come up with a date that the early earth is like 10, 20,000 years old? People use the genealogies, and what they do is they start adding up the ages of this guy lived 900 years, this guy lived 969 years, this guy lived, and they add up all the genealogies, and you end up, and then if you add up the genealogies, they say that's how old the earth is by adding up the genealogies. Can you do that? Are genealogies meant to give us chronology? Chronology has to do with chronos is time. Genealogy has to do with what? Father, son, father, son, or whatever in the family coming down like that. Chronology and genealogy are two different things. You can't mix them, and I'll show you how they are not. Okay, so the two big genealogies that people try to establish the age of the earth are Genesis chapter 5, the genealogy of Adam, and then Genesis chapter 11 with the genealogy coming from Noah down to the time of Abraham. So they use and they add up those numbers of how old these guys lived and things. The problem with that is, is that if you add up the genealogy, you end up with 4004 BC. If you add up the genealogy, as Bishop Usher did, you come up that the earth was created at 4004 BC. Why can't that be? If the earth was created at 4004 BC, do you need a flood at least a thousand years later? because many of those guys live 900 years, at least it, now you're, you're from 4,000, you're down to when did the flood happen? 3,000 or into the 2,000? What's the problem with that? Do we have written records back into the 3,000 from both Mesopotamia at Sumer and in Egypt? So it can't be. And by the way, there's a tower probably as big as those two pillars in this area between the two pillars at Jericho that's 8,000 years old. Well, if, the, if that tower at Jericho is 8,000 years old, how can the earth be created at 4,000? You know what I'm saying? Did God make the tower? Okay, that was, I'm sorry, that was supposed to be a joke, okay? God didn't make the tower, okay? Human beings made that tower at 8,000 B.C. and stuff. So you've got to be real careful with it. Now, let me just show you this and demonstrate. If you've got your Bibles, pop over to Matthew chapter 1, 
And I'll show you the genealogy of Jesus Christ. The genealogy, are there holes, are there holes in the genealogy of Jesus Christ? Yeah, okay. So if you look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 8, it says, Solomon was the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam the father of Aviah, Aviah the father of Asa. And then verse 8, Asa was the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat was the father of Jehoram. And then it says, Jehoram was the father of Uzziah, in verse 8, First uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 8. Jehoram was the father of Uzziah. Is that wrong? Was Jehoram the father of Uzziah? And the answer is no, he was not. Jehoram was not the father of Uzziah. Okay, now that's a fact. Whether you agree with me or disagree, it doesn't make any difference. That's a fact. Jehoram was not the father of Uzziah. He was the great-great-grandfather. There's three names that are skipped here. There are three names that are skipped between Jehoram and Uzziah. There are three names that were skipped. Now you say, Hildebrand, how do you know that? And you say, you're talking real dogmatic here, Hildebrand. How do you know that? Well, I, I don't know anything. I go to the Bible. If you go to 1 Chronicles chapter 3.11, it tells us the names of the three kings that were from Jehoram to Uzziah. It lists the three kings that are skipped. And their names are Ahaziah, Joash, and Amaziah, or Azariah, I'm sorry, Azariah. Those are uh, the Amaziah. That was right um, the first time. Ahaziah, Joash, and Amaziah are skipped. So three names are skipped. Now, why would Matthew skip three names? He's coming down a list of the kings of Israel. Would most Jews know the kings of Israel? Okay, we don't memorize the kings in this class, but most Jews would know the kings, and they'd know those three names are skipped. Why did Matthew do that? Let me read you a thing. Over in verse, going down to verse 17, check this out, Matthew chapter 1, verse 17. There are 14 generations from Abraham to David. Okay, 14 generations from Abraham to David. What was the date of Abraham, approximately? 2,000. What's David? 1,000. Okay, we know that. Abraham's 2,000, David's 1,000. There are 14 generations from Abraham to David. There are 14 generations from David until the exile to Babylon. So from David, 1,000, down to 586 of the Babylonian captivity, there are 14 generations. And then it says there are 14 generations from the exile to Babylon to Christ. So 14 generations, Abraham to David, 14 generations, David to the exile, and 14 generations from the exile down to Jesus. How did Matthew make it come out to be 14, 14, and 14? Guess what he did with three of the names? Do you guys... I know about fudge factors. I, I was in science and stuff, and they call these fudge factors. In other words, it didn't work out, right? So he dropped three names to make it 14. Now you say, he didn't really do that. Yeah, he really did that. Okay, we know the three names that he skipped here. Now, why did he do that? One suggestion, and I think it is a good one, actually. In English, we do what? Do you have letters that compose words? You have letters that compose words. Do we have numbers like one, two, three, four, five? Is the one, two, three, four, five different than the ABC? So we have two different systems, numbers and letters, okay? Two different systems. Do you realize that Jews use their alphabet for their numbers? Now question, is that a problem? Okay, so A is one, B is two, C is three, D is what, four, E, whatever, you know, go down, okay? Their letters are their numbers. Is that, does, can that at points create problems? Because you don't know whether you're looking at a number or whether you're looking at a word. It's very interesting, very, very interesting, that if you take the Hebrew letter for D, which is four, the number four, V is six, and you take D is four, and you add those together, you got four plus six plus four, it's what? 14. Who is this? David. Okay, so the suggestion here is that Matthew, that Matthew is subtly saying Jesus Christ is whose son? The son of David. 14, 14, 14. David, David, David. You see what he's doing? So he drops those threes to make it 14 because what is his point? If you didn't get it, he says it explicitly in verse 1. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. And then does he build that genealogy to, to basically show that? Yeah, okay. Now, by the way, is it okay to drop three names like that? By the way, the word father, can the word father also mean ancestor? Yeah, the word father means ancestor, okay? Jesus Christ, the son of David. 
Jesus Christ, the son of David. Is the word son there used what? There's how much from David to Jesus? Jesus was zero, right? David's a thousand, so there's what, a thousand years there. Okay, Jesus wasn't really zero. I was just saying that to see if anybody smiled. But anyways, okay, so you've got a thousand down to the time of Jesus. It's about a thousand years, okay? So Jesus Christ, the son of David, he was the what? He was the descendant of David. Jesus Christ's father was not David directly. His father was, you know, God and the Holy Spirit and things, but it, it just, you know, I'm saying David, David was his ancestor. David was his ancestor through Mary. So this is what I think is going on there. So all I'm trying to say is, do we know for sure that there are holes in genealogies? Yes. Okay, you can't use genealogy to establish chronology. There may be holes. Who knows how long those holes will be? So, okay. So that leaves you with the 4004. They, nobody accepts that today. This is something Bishop Usher did way back. And, I think, and so nobody holds that today because, for example, Jericho, we've got stuff in Jericho that goes back to 8000 B.C., Okay, and so it can't be right. And so we just, we realized that the genealogies didn't give us, when it says father, son, that there may be huge gaps. There may be, you know, he may be the great, 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 great grandfather of so-and-so. So be careful with that stuff. All right. Now, in the book of Genesis, we're talking with chapter one. There's some patterns here. And I want to show you two patterns. These are kind of interesting in terms of the patterns of Genesis 1, the days of creation. This is called the fiat fulfillment pattern. And here it is. See if you recognize this. Uh, it happens over and over again. Here's Genesis 1, the seven days of Genesis. Do you remember this, the seven days of Genesis? It always starts out, and God said, okay, and God said, there's an announcement. And God said, okay, so it starts out, and God said, that's an announcement. There's a command or a fiat, a command or a fiat. And God said, let there be what? Let there be light, okay, day one. Let there be, uh, what, a firmament above, separating the waters above and the waters below. Let there be dry ground come up. Let the, let the heavens, uh, like, go sun, moon, and stars. And so let there be, God makes a command, and God said there's an announcement, then there's a command, let there be let there be, let's just use the first, uh, the first day. Let there be light. And then what's this? The fulfillment. God said, let there be light. And there was light. Okay. God said, let there be X. That's maybe another way to put it. X, that sounds too impersonal. It sounds like algebra class. But anyway, sorry. <laughs> let there be X. And there was what? X. Okay. Whatever the, you know, day of the six days. Then God, does God evaluate his own work? It's interesting. Does God evaluate his own work? After he's created, does he look back and evaluate it? He evaluates it, and God saw that it, the light, the sun, moon, and stars, whatever he was working on, and God, he evaluates his work, and he saw that it was tov, that it was good, and he pronounces it good. And then there's the end of the day, and there was evening, and there was morning, day what? Day Y, okay? Day one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, okay? On the seventh day, God's evaluation was, on the seventh day, God rested, and God looked on the seventh day, and he saw everything that he had made, and that it was what? Very good, okay? Tov me'od, it was very good, okay? And so at the end, God reflects on the whole thing. It was very good. Now, by the way, do you remember seeing this pattern over and over again with every one of the days? So this is kind of a literary structure that each of the days is put in, and it's kind of neat. This is called the fiat fulfillment pattern. Now, the next one is actually how I remember the days of Genesis, okay? If, if I asked you what was on day five, would you know just like that what's on day five? Would you know that which was on four day four and things? Okay, this is how I remember it. Do you know what's, what was created on day one? Okay, he said, let there be light was day one. And what day was man created? Six. If you know the first and the sixth day, then you've got all the other days, okay? And the second pattern I'll show you uh, does this, okay? Oh, I skipped this stuff here. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3 says, By the word of the Lord, the, the worlds were formed. And so it's, it's talking about the power of God's word, his spoken word calling things into being. Psalm 33, 6 and 9, the creation by the word of his mouth. By the word of his mouth, God created. So God created speaking and that's kind of an interesting thing with this fiat fulfillment. Now, here's the parallel day scheme. Now, this is really neat, and don't kind of get blown away. This, this is fairly easy. Okay, on day one, God said, let there be light. There was light. 
On the parallel day and day four, he makes the what? The light bearers. What would be an example of light bearers? Sun, moon, and stars. So on day one, he makes the light. On day four, he makes the light bearers. On day two, he separates the waters above from the waters below. Now, what are the waters below? The oceans and things like that. What are the waters above? Like clouds and things like that, okay? So he separates the waters above and the waters below. On day five, he makes the fish and the birds. Where do the fish inhabit? The waters below. Where do the birds inhabit? The waters above. So you get the birds and the fish going in the waters above and the waters below. On day three, he makes the dry land. And on day four, six, he makes the inhabitants. This should be inhabitants of the dry land. Who's, who are some of the inhabitants of the dry land? Us, people. So he makes people and land animals, land critters. He makes land critters on the sixth day and us and, and on the day three. So by the way, if you know land critters are made on day six, us, and day five is the light, if you know day one is light, do you know what day four is? Yeah, it's the light bearers. If you know day six, he makes the land critters, do you know what day three is, the dry land? And in the middle, you have the what? The waters above and the waters below, the fish and the birds. Do you see how that works? So it's, okay, I hope I'm not just dreaming here, but this makes it really easy. If you know the first and last day, then you kind of can, can reconstruct the rest of it. By the way, what day did I skip? The Shabbat, okay, I skipped Shabbat, and that's the Sabbath day, and on the Sabbath day, God rested. Question, did God rest because he was tired? No, okay, he rested. Okay, God rested, and so the Shabbat is set up uh, not just because of a person being tired, but God's reflect does things on day. Now, one other thing that I need to point out about this chart. In Gen do you guys remember Jack in Genesis 1-2? And the earth was darkness and vo vo how should I say? The, the earth was tohu wavohu, was, was formless and empty. Do you remember the words with formless and empty and darkness was upon the face of the day and spirit over the world? The world was formless and <coughs> empty. Do you see what these days do? On days 1, 2, and 3, these are days of forming. In other words, the earth was formless and empty. And what does God do? He takes the formless shape and he what? He shapes, he forms that which was formless. And then he does what? He fills that which is empty. So these three days are days of filling. And these three days are days of forming. So that which was formless becomes, takes shape, takes form. And that which was empty becomes, gets filled. By the way, even with human beings, he tells human beings we are to be what? Fruitful and multiply and do what to the earth? Fill the earth. Okay, fill the earth. And so you get this forming and filling uh, in the creation account and stuff. And I, I don't know, I just like this. This helps me to put the whole thing together. If I know the first day and the sixth day, I've got the rest of it. Okay? So just a parallel day structure kind of thing. Now, let's jump over. And what I want to do next is talk about... Um, the image of God in man. And so we want to start out with these kind of questions on the image of God in man. This question, what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be human? Is this a big question today? Are you folks in your lifetime going to face this big time? Okay, let me just explain how it's going to come about that this is going to be a major question for you. Okay, um, first of all, is man one or two parts or three parts? Is it man, body, soul, and spirit? Or is it just body, soul, spirit? Or some people just say, all you are is body. You know, your brain, when your brain, that's it. All you are is your body. So what is human being? How is, it, how is he composed? How are human beings different than the animals? And we got some people today, it's like, uh, what is it? Uh, save the animals, kill all the people. You know what I'm saying? You have those kind of things uh, where, where the animals are actually seem to be more important than people. Uh, we got some groups, uh, I always get a kick out of PETA and things like that. I always tell people I'm a PETA person. Uh, I'm a person who eats tasty animals, okay? So I'm a PETA person. That doesn't usually go over too well, and probably some of you are going but anyways, people eat tasty animals, so anyway, sorry. Uh, but anyways, how does, how does cloning fit in? How does cloning fit in? Can they take now some of your, 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 your cells 
and actually build another you. Is that if they build another you, do you remember they did that sheep? What was that sheep? Uh, Dolly, okay. They built a sheep and so what happens if they do that with a person? Is that really you or is that really somebody different? You know, if you work with cloning, what what does it mean to be human at that point? And what does it mean to be what does it mean to be you? Okay. Um, cyborgs and things are human beings getting more parts from other places. In other words, all of a sudden, uh, was it Peter Stein gets a, or donates a kidney? Do people donate kidneys from another person? And now you're walking around, you got a kidney from another person. Is that you or them? You know, uh, you got uh, what? Hearts. Are hearts being transplanted now between people? Uh, livers. You think of Steve Jobs. Um, I, I was told that I don't know whether this is true and that he's got pancreatic cancer, which is a really um, yeah, it's all over kind of thing. I mean, pancreatic cancer is fatal and stuff. But did, did Jobs, I think he got a liver. Does, does anybody know that? I think he got a liver, didn't he? And the liver was transplanted. Is that really pretty cool that they transplant a liver? And then what, you know, what sense, did they transplant somebody else's heart into you? Is that still you then? Or what? My wife faces this problem because she, um, she just, uh, I call her a bionic woman, and she, she just had a, a knee put in. So she's titanium woman now, and she's got this titanium, no joke, <laughs> knee and stuff. And so you got to stay away when she wants to kick you and stuff. She's also got, she broke her ankle, so she's got some plates in her foots and a few screws there. I always said, a few screws loose there, but anyways. Uh, but no, so okay, you go to the airport. You go, I go to the airport with my wife and stuff, and you walk through the thing. What happens? <laughs> Take off all your metal and stuff, and she's like freak. And now I don't, we don't go to the airport anymore because of the way you get groped when you go through there. But anyways, uh, sorry, that was, uh, no. By the way, I say that you guys laugh. I say that you guys laugh. It's not a laughing matter. My, my son has a 25-year-old wife, 25-year-old. Every time they go to the airport, her number gets called every time. Does that give you a clue? That, does that get you angry? My son uh, actually ended up driving out to his sister's wedding 22 hours so his wife wouldn't have to get uh, checked out at the airport, okay? And this, I don't know. All I'm saying is some of the stuff the TSA is doing now really bothers me, okay? And uh, they do it in the name of safety, but it's a lot of bad stuff. But anyways, let me talk about spiritual machines. So what I'm saying is, is it possible for body parts people have what? Uh, different, you know, leg parts and arm parts and things like that. And by the way, is that good? Yeah, it's good for some people. I mean, some of the guys have their legs blown off, they get them put back on this thing. What about spiritual machines? Do you know anything about Moore's Law? Moore's Law basically says this, that computers double in intelligence every 18 to 24 months. 18 to 24 months, it's about every two years, computers double in intelligence. I want you to think about that. Now, back when I was in high school, just after the Civil War, they, have, they had a computer, and the computer, our first school and high, computer was this big by this big. It was, it was huge. It was huge, and it had two memory units. It had two memory units, so you did A squared plus B squared equals C squared. You could do the A squared, you could do the B squared, but there wasn't, like, you didn't have a third place to put stuff. There were two memory units, okay, in the whole computer. It cost $5,000. It was huge. Okay, all this stuff. Now what happened? What happened? In 18 to 24 months, it went from two to what? Two to four. And then another, it went from four to what? To eight. And then from eight to 16, 16 to 32, six, 32 to 64. And then all of a sudden it starts going up. So what happens after a period of time? Now it goes to one megabyte, it goes to two megabytes, it goes to four megabytes, 16, and now all of a sudden we're doing what? Gigabytes. And it goes from one gigabyte to two gigabytes to four gigs, six, or four to eight to 16 to 32, and now we got terabytes, and now we got terabytes. One terabyte goes to two terabytes, four terabytes, and every 18 months it's doubling intelligence. Question, can a computer play a, play a human being in chess? Can a computer win? Yeah. Yes, okay. A computer, they can program a computer to win at chess. Now question, the computer keeps getting smarter and smarter. Is it getting smarter than you guys are getting smarter? Yeah. Okay, and so what uh, Ray Kurzweil down at MIT is saying that this stuff here is carbon. This is carbon, and this stuff here only works so well. The computers keep doubling in intelligence, and what he's suggesting is by 2025, computers will be smarter than you guys. I'll be dead, so, but it'll be smarter than you guys, okay? <laughs> all right, because why? Computers' intelligence doubles all the time, and what he's saying is carbon Carbon is history. What he's saying is the future is silicon, that what's going to happen is the computers will go buy us in intelligence by 2020 or 2025. You guys will be alive. It's what, 
10, 15 years from now, this, this kind of stuff is going to happen. Do you already have robots and stuff that you can talk to and tell to do stuff? Okay, now are they really pretty stupid at this point? Yeah, and that's what he says. They're about the intelligence of a mosquito, but what's the, what's the benefit of them? Every two to two years, they double. So question, do you see where it's going? Are, are, eventually, will we have computer probably as robots that are able to talk to you in open conversation? Okay, will, and actually, will they be smarter than you are? Okay, this is where we're going. So then what does it mean to be human when you got a machine that's smarter than a human being? What, what does it mean to be human? Do you see where this is going? So, okay, so we look out in the landscape and we say, whoa, there's some pretty big things happening. Now, what does the scripture say about this? This is the verse that's kind of like critical for understanding what it means to be human. This is what the Bible says. When God goes to make man in Genesis chapter 1, this is what he says. This is a big verse. This, is, this stuff is very significant and meaningful. God said, let us, notice the let, did he say let me make man? No, he said let us make man in our image and in our likeness and let them do what? Let us make man in our image and let them do what? Rule. Okay, so is man designed to rule? Let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the livestock and over the, all the earth and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Man is made in the image of God. Are the animals made in the image of God? No. Man is made in the image of God. Now, the question is then, what does the image of God mean? What is it? Okay, and so I want to go through four aspects of this image of God. These aspects combine, and they're not mutually exclusive. They overlap and things, but just uh, four aspects of the image of God. Let me run through four of them first, and then we'll cover them in detail. First, human beings have spiritual and moral qualities. Human beings have spiritual and moral qualities. Uh, a grizzly bear up in Yellowstone Park just before we got there. A grizzly bear eats a human being. Killed, kills a human being. Is that grizzly bear immoral? A grizzly bear eats salmon. Is the grizzly bear immoral? Is that what, do grizzly bears eat stuff? Okay, is that what they are? Is, is it moral or immoral? It's what grizzly bears do. Yeah. Yeah, does everybody hear that? That's a good, that's a good response. It's amoral. It's, it's not moral. And it doesn't work in the categories. A grizzly bear, you can't give a grizzly bear a lecture and put him in jail and say, you're going to jail for five years for eating this guy. I, shouldn't, I'm, I don't mean to be um, light about it. Uh, obviously, the guy was killed and his wife was spared. And that's really bad. But the question, are you dealing with an animal? The animal doesn't have the sense of right and wrong. It's as he said, it's amoral. Okay. Now, by the way, human beings, if a human being eats somebody, now, is, is that a problem? Is he going to hit me with this? I was a moral act and stuff. Is it amoral. Now, we would say it's what? Immoral. Okay, do we eat people? You eat people, is that a problem? Okay, that's a problem. Now, by the way, is there a difference, even in morality, is there a difference? I mean, somebody eats somebody else, we say, whoa, that's a problem, okay, and stuff. Are, is there different levels of morality in things? Um, uh, my son, for example, when he was young, my son was uh, supposed to be down at a Bible study with this uh, child evangelism fellowship, and they were doing Bible study. Well, I come home, my son's riding his bike around the neighborhood, and I came in a different way, so he didn't know where I was coming from, so he gets home, and I say, hey, how was the how was, uh, child evangelism fellowship? He says, oh, yeah, it was great, Dad, and stuff. I says, oh, really? What, uh, what kind of story did they tell? And, uh, and so you see him go like this, he's, it was... Uh, Oh, Noah and the Flood. Noah and the Flood. So he starts telling me about Noah and the Flood and stuff, and he makes up this story and stuff. Now, question, did my son lie to me? Basically, have all my kids lied to me, to be honest with you. Yeah, okay. So I catch my son lying to me. Question, is that on the same level as cannibalism? Would, would you say, now, by the way, it, it's a little different, okay? Some people say, all sins are the same, all sins, well... <laughs> then you can go to the cannibals first, man, because they're all the same, then you shouldn't have any problem with it. Okay, but what I'm saying is, sorry, that was, yeah, I'm sorry, that was totally out of line, but what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, you know, my son, my son telling me a, a lie like that, question, by the way, was it wrong that my son lied to me? And, and so, yeah, there's, you know, things you got to do with that. Is that different than eating somebody, okay? I just want to say there's some differences there, so you got to be careful, yeah. I believe that 
they're all the same, but they have different consequences, I guess is another way to put it. Okay, I don't yeah. believe that, but uh, yeah, <laughs> all right. She's saying they're all the same, but there's different consequences. And I want to say, no, I... I Yeah, the, well, the consequences are for sure are different. Okay, is she right on the consequences are different? Yes, the consequences are majorly different. But I want to say that also there's, how should I say, different. In other words, isn't there innately within you a different reaction if somebody's going to be cannibalism versus lying and stuff like that? What I'm saying is get a, get a handle on that, that yes, they're both sins. First of all, let's just say it, they're both sins, and that's where you're, they're the same and that they're both sins. But I want to distinguish, there's, how should I say, doesn't your gut tell you that Cannibalism is worse than my son lying to me. I mean, your gut should tell you something on that. And if it doesn't, then uh, I'd like salt and pepper when you take me down. <laughs> Anyways, sorry. Okay, but okay, there's a big debate on this and we'll, we'll work on that, so sorry. Now, yeah. Yeah, and that's what she would be pushing, that all sins are the same. But what I'm saying is you're going to see different reactions from people and, and from God, and from God on different sins. In other words, will God get really frosted over some sins and other sins? And that, by the way, they're all sins and stuff, and they're all sins that you know, can damn you to hell, so to speak. But it just, you know what I'm saying, it, God's reaction seems to be different on some of them in terms of when we go through the Old Testament, you're going to see a real strong reaction for some stuff and others not. And I want to try to, I want to come to grips with that. I want to try to understand that so that I can understand God better and things and how he moves with sin. But excellent point. Now, relational, relational simply means that part of the image of God is relational, that let us make man in our image. There's a plurality there, and so that's relational. Uh, dominion and rule, that the image of God has something to do with our, as human beings, ruling and having dominion over the earth. And so we want to look at that rule aspect and how that, uh, how that works. Uh, and by the way, can you see the perversion of this? That people rule. Do people try to rule other people? And does power corrupt? The absolute power corrupts absolutely. So what you have here is humankind, sinful humankind, taking this rule and try to use it to dominate and, and, and that kind of stuff. And that's a real problem. This one I'm going to have the hardest time selling you guys. And what I'm going to try to say to you is that we actually look like God. What I'm going to try to suggest is we actually look like God physically that there's a physicality to God, and we look like God. And you say, Hillebrand, is God a bald old man? And I say, no, okay, we look like God. I'm going to try to say as far as our humanity, not in the particulars of being bald and fat. Okay, now, let's work through this. Spiritual qualities, okay? The ability to make moral choices. Man is made in the image of God. Humankind is made in the image of God. He's given the ability to make moral choices. Animals don't make moral choices that we know. Man is capable of making that. Where do we find proof for this? We go to the New Testament, and it's really kind of interesting. Colossians in the New Testament parallels the book of Ephesians. There's a lot of overlap between Colossians and Ephesians in the New Testament. And so we've got a parallel passage between Colossians 3.10 and Ephesians 4.24. It says, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. In the image of its creator, it's being renewed in what? In knowledge. Do human beings have the ability to know? We have the ability to know, and we are being renewed in the image of Christ. Okay, do you see what's happening here? Is, does the image need renewing? The image was damaged in the fall, and the image then needs to be renewed. And so what we get is this, and then here in Ephesians it says, and to put on the new self, created, we are created to be like God. We are created to be like God. In true, how? How like God? In true righteousness and holiness. Can human beings be holy? Oh, let me say it first this way. Can God, is God holy? God, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, okay? God is holy. Do human beings have the capacity to be holy? Yeah. Be ye holy, God says, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Righteousness, righteousness as opposed to wickedness. Are human beings moral beings? 
they have the capacity for righteousness, do they also have the capacity for wickedness? And so he's saying, let it be renewed in the, in the image of Christ, that the image of Christ is being made like God in true knowledge, righteousness, and true holiness, I believe as the confession says. So this is where we get that, that basically there's a spiritual moral aspect, that human beings are made spiritually and morally like God. We, we can know, we can be righteous or unrighteous, we can be holy and we can be unholy, but we have the capacity to be holy, righteous, and know. And so this is the moral side of that based on these verses. Now, what happens though, in, when the fall happens, when Adam and Eve fall into sin, did we lose the image of God? Did we lose the image of God? And what happens is James tells us, no, the image may be marred. The image may be marred, but we didn't lose it. And so James 3.9 says, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men, we curse men who are made in God's likeness. James is saying human beings are still made in God's likeness, and therefore you shouldn't curse them because they are made in God's likeness and God's image. Does that mean then that everyone in this class is made in God's image? Yes. Should that affect how we treat one another then? Okay, yes, okay. Does that affect then how I treat you as students made in the image of God? Yes. Does that mean how you treat me, made in the image of God? That stuff, it should affect how you, you know, treat people in response to this. So people are still made in the image of God, but it's marred and stuff, and there's implications. We'll talk about the implications more later. Now, another aspect of the image of God is the usness of the image of God. The usness of it, or the relational aspect of it. Um, let us make man in our image. The us and our are singular or plural. They're plural. Let us make man in our image. So we are made in the image of God, us. Uh, man is built for relationship. And so how do you understand that plurality? Let us make man in our image. There's different ways you can understand it. And this kind of goes through uh, some of those. And let me just start out with the plural of majesty. Um, did your mother ever to say to you, uh, we have decided that you shouldn't be going to this place, okay? We have decided, and the assumption is it's the father and the mother decided, but it was really the mother to decide, and she says, we have decided, okay? But kind of like, does she get to say that because she's the mother kind of thing? That, and the implications, the dad's in there. Uh, when a king says, a king says, we have decided, is it really the king making a decision? But it's kind of like, does the king get to use the, what we call the royal we? Does the king get to do that? Yeah, it's like the king says, we have decided. It's really him, but he's the king. In Hebrew, they have a thing called the plural of majesty. Plural of majesty. In English, we've got what? Singular, and that means you've got one of them. Plural means what? Two or more. So we use plurality to assign what? the number of something, whether it's singular or whether it's plural, multiple numbers. In Hebrew, they do singular and plural, but they also have something, when something is really, really, really big, they use the plural, okay? They use the plural when something is really big, this plural of majesty. So you'd have what? Stuff, and then if you wanted to say the stuff was like really, really big, you'd say what? Stuffs, okay? You'd put an S on it to make it like that. Now for us, when we say stuffs, that means many stuff. But when they say stuffs and stuff, they may mean this is big stuff, okay? So, sorry, that I should have used a probably different word here. But anyway, so do, you, do you know what I'm saying with the plural of majesty then? In other words, it's so big that let us make man, God speaking in an us kind of way in the majesty. That's a possibility. That's a possibility based on Hebrew grammar. It could be let us make man. I think there's some other better possibilities here. Heavenly court. Does anybody remember Isaiah chapter 6? God is in his heavenly court, and God asks the question, Who will go for us? Who will go for us? And the plural is used there. God is speaking to these heavenly beings who will go for us. Isaiah says, Here am I, Lord, send me. Does anybody remember Job in the book of Job, the first chapter? God is up there, and he basically says, uh, Hey, have you guys considered my servant Job? And he's talking to the group in the heavenly court. There's an us there, and Satan steps forward and says, Well, hey, Job's good, but he's just good because you bless him with all his stuff. Let me take that away, and he'll curse you to your face. Okay, so this us of the heavenly court, 
Does that make sense? Let us make man in our image that, that God is talking in the heavenly court. I think there's ramifications both from Job 1 and Isaiah chapter 6 that this may be likely. Okay, I want to put a plus sign here. This is, I think, a real good shot at it. Now, maybe God's talking to himself. Did you ever talk to yourself? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Should we do this? We do that. If we do this, then there's going to be all these consequences. If we do that, then there's going to be all these consequences. What should we do? You talk, do you ever talk to yourself? Okay. Okay. A lot of guys don't talk to yourself. Anyways, I talk to myself. But anyways, and so you could adjust. You could use a self-deliberation. What shall we do kind of thing within yourself? What shall we do self-deliberation? By the way, does the Bible have very much self-deliberation like that? Almost never. I don't, yeah, to be honest, I couldn't tell you right now a passage where you get this God talking to himself kind of thing. So the self-deliberation, I think this is, this is bogus. This is wrong. It rarely ever occurs in Scripture, so I don't think you want to bring that in. Some people say the let us make man in our image is a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that this is the discussion among the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let us make man in our image, and then it's the trinity. A lot of people suggest this, and I'm not ready to say it's wrong, but I ask you, would Moses have understood the Trinity? How well would Moses have understood the Trinity? Would Moses have understood Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? As a matter of fact, in the time of Jesus, this is like 1,400, 1,200 years later, in the time of Jesus did they understand Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, when Jesus says he's the Son of God, did they want to stone him and kill him? So what I'm saying is, how well was the Trinity understood back then? I want to say, I don't think Moses had a clue on the Trinity very much. Yeah, he could have had, but, but the problem is, too, nobody would have known that. I mean, suppose God showed Moses a Trinity, but when Moses comes down from the mount, you know, none of those people are going to have a clue what he's talking about because God, in the Old Testament, God is one. The Lord our God is one, and they really pushed that. So I'm not sure how well he knew the Trinity. So I'm, what I'm saying is, would Moses have understood this very much? By the way, did the early church, did it take the church 300 years to figure out the Trinity? Okay, the early church really wrestled over this thing with the Trinity. So I'm saying, I don't know whether how well Moses, I don't, I don't the Trinity is, let us make man in our image. It could be, could be, I don't want to eliminate it, but all I'm saying is, I got to get back in Moses' shoes and I don't think so. Do you want? Uh, what I'm wanting to suggest is that if you start saying Moses is writing down, he has down stuff, things that he has no clue of, you got to be careful with that because um, now it's possible he wrote better than he knew. It's possible he wrote better than he knew. But I've got to have some good reason for that. Like he, in other words, if he's telling you something in the future. So it's possible here he wrote better than he knew. I don't want to eliminate this possibility. I'm just saying it. I don't think he understood the Trinity. I, don't, I think this thing... Would he have understood the heavenly court? Yes, because the other cultures also had heavenly court ideas, and so the heavenly court idea seems more natural given the historical framework in which he would have been writing. Now, by the way, is it possible that's wrong too? Okay, I wasn't there. I'm, I mean, I'm old, but not that old. And so anyways, what I'm saying is I wasn't there. I don't know. So I want to keep the Trinity, put it in the back burner. I want to bring forward the heavenly court. And then, um, but, but either of these are going to be options, okay? Can we do that without saying we don't know, but... Those are two valid options. This one, thumbs down to. This one here, possible, but I doubt it. I think it's more specific. Uh, by the way, does the us shape us? Is it me or is it us that shapes us? Does your culture shape who you are? Does your culture shape who you are? Does your family background and things shape who you are? To quote somebody, and I don't, but does it take a village to make a person kind of thing? Does it take a we? Does it take a we to make a, a me? Does it take a we to make a me? Okay? And so what happens is your backgrounds and stuff shape who you are. Are we relationally built? I guess that's what I'm saying. Are we relationally built? Are, does the us build the I? Does the us build the I? And just look around. I mean, all you guys are from different areas. You all come from different backgrounds. And it's shaped you in a different way than other people, which is really neat because we're all unique in that sense. But okay, so the us shaping the I. Human beings, are we built for relationship? I guess that's the point I want to make. Are human beings built for an us context? Yes, okay, we're built from an us context to an us context. So relationships can be really important for the image of God and the shaping of that. Now, 
This thing with the ruling, uh, let's look at this. The image of God is ruling. Let us make man in our image that in order to rule. In the Old Testament, is God the sovereign? Now, if I say sovereign, what do I mean by sovereign? Is God the king? God is the king. God rules, the, he is the great king. Let me just say this. God is the great king. He puts humankind on earth to what? To rule. Do we rule in the place of God? Are we like, the term I want is vice regents, but are we like, how should I say, a president of the United States rules the United States, but can he really rule everything? No. And so do you have governors in different states ruling in the governors in the states? By the way, are almost all kingdoms set up like this, where you have the great king, and then you have people ruling under him, ruling little areas under him. And so what you have in this creation account is that God creates humankind in his image to rule over the fish of the air, the birds of the sea, and the creatures that crawl around, that we are actually in God's place ruling over the creation. We are, are, this is, are we little gods, in one sense, little gods ruling over part of his creation? And that has, has God committed, that's maybe a terrible way to say it, that's yeah, a terrible way to say it and stuff. You get, but but you see the point. Has God given some of his, his rule over to us to administer? Maybe that's a better way of saying it. Has God given over some of his rule, and we as vice regents rule in behalf of the great king? Okay. Now, how does this uh, get established and things like that? Uh, it's very interesting. The kings of the ancient world would have representatives that would rule, in other words, you'd have the great king, and the, the great king would have uh, sub-kings over various areas that the king conquered. And so you basically, uh, kings would have representatives, and they would rule in the king's place. They would rule in the king's place. Does anybody remember uh, Cyrus, Darius, and those guys? And they basically had this huge kingdom and things, and they ruled through the various satraps and various things that people ruled under them in the name of Cyrus, in the name of Darius, okay? And it happens to almost every kingdom where you have the big king rules the whole thing, and then these uh, governors, um, diplomats, and things will rule over the other thing. And that's the way it was back in the Syrian times. Notice the emphasis in Genesis 126 is on ruling. Now, does this have huge implications and things of how, what are the implications for this in terms of uh, meaning and destiny? Are humankind built to rule? Um, and this, we are God's vice regents on this earth. Does it matter how we rule the creation? Humankind is given to rule over the birds of the air, fish of the sea, and the humankind is given to rule over the earth. God has given the rule, his rule over to us. Therefore, do human beings need to take care, for example, of the environment? Do the human beings, are we ruling in God's place over God's good earth? Are we ruling over God's good earth? And does it make a difference how we rule in terms of the environment? Therefore, should Christian people be involved in environmentalist type stuff? Now, I'm not a real big tree hugger or anything like that, but do we have a stewardship for ruling over the of animals and over the over the earth of the earth? So therefore, there's a basis for environmentalism. Is there a basis? in environmentalism, right back to the image of God and this rule that we have that God has committed to us over the, over the world. So that's, yeah, Eric? I wouldn't say that we rule in place of God. I would say that God gives us free will to make our own decisions and we can think, all right, we rule over everything else. Like, like not rule over everything else, but like rule over like the animals and stuff like that. Yeah. But I think that God still has Control yeah, yeah, okay. What, what we're, we're talking about here is a relationship between the great king and the king's under him. God controls everything. Yeah. Okay, you got you to work with that. God controls everything. But he's committed some of the control and movement to other people. Yeah, yeah. Now, he still controls that too. Exactly. But, but, but you've got to, but, but, but that, with that ability to rule come certain responsibilities for us that we are to rule in his place and therefore we have certain responsibilities on how we uh, we manifest, actually, how we manifest the rule of God on this earth, okay, should reflect the glory and goodness of God. 
and, but not taking, usurping his power because he's the great king. He rules everything. Yeah. Okay, now, this one's going to be the hardest sell. What I'm going to try to suggest here is that we actually look like God, that we actually physically, physically look like God. Now you say, well, how did you get this? Uh, well, there's two Hebrew terms, likeness and image. The terms for likeness and image are selim and demut. Okay, selim and demut are the two Hebrew terms. If you do a word study on these two words, selim and demut, like image and likeness, uh, they are very physical terms. They are very physical terms. They're not moral terms. They're very physical terms. So, for example, let me just give you one example. From 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 5. 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 5. It says that the, the Philistine made images, Selim or Demute, they made Selim or Demute images of these rats out of gold. They made these images of rats out of gold. Now, question, did these gold rats look like rats? Yeah, but they were made of gold. So they weren't real rats. They looked like rats, though. Did they physically look like rats? Could you look at that gold rat and say, that's a rat? but it's in gold, okay? So what I'm saying is that there's a physical resemblance, and we see that here. By the way, you guys all know this. Uh, in the ancient world, in, in Israel and stuff, if it says, did, did the Israelites ever make images for themselves? If I said images for you, were those images physical images? Did they make physical images of Dagon and Baal and Kamosh, some of the ancient gods, and they made these images of them? Were those physical? They were physical images, and then the people bowed down to those, those images. What were the images made out of, by the way? We know what they were made out of. What were they made out of? Yeah, somebody said gold. Those were the rich ones and stuff. What did most people made them out of what? Stone, stone and wood, right? You make your images out of stone and wood. You, you played them with gold and other things like that. Uh, sometimes, you, you know, but anyways, let's get out of there. Uh, but but uh, what I'm saying is the images were something that was physical. So what I'm trying to suggest is that these two terms here are both very physical terms. Images usually was something very, very physical. So what I'm suggesting is then we're actually physically, we look like God. Now let me push that one step further. I'm going to use here some of the Assyrian kings, okay? Now suppose I'm an Assyrian king. You're lucky I'm not. But uh, anyways, the Assyrians were very, very, very cruel. And... Uh, some of the, they're kind of like the Hitlers of the ancient world. And uh, the Assyrian kings, you had the great Assyrian king, and when he conquered a new territory, guess what he did? When the Assyrian king would conquer a new territory, he would put up a statue of himself. What did that statue, what was that statue mean? It meant that I, the great king, my statue is in, in say, Zoba or Damascus. That means then that I am king in Damascus and Zoba. Okay, so the king put up an, a physical image made out of stone, raised himself. It kind of reminds me of who is that guy? It was a guy in uh, what was it Iraq that had this big statue of himself? And, and do you remember? And then he pulled down Saddam Hussein's image and stuff. But in other words, the image meant that what? I am king of this territory. Now look at what God does. Look what God does. God makes an image of Himself and puts it on the earth. Is that a way that God is declaring his sovereignty, his kingship over the earth? That is, we are the image of God. He puts us down here to rule in his place. And so that there's a physical resemblance, we resemble God as the Assyrian king makes a statue, an image, and puts it over the territory that he rules. Now God also puts, or before that actually, God put his image in us and puts us on the earth to rule. Now, let me just push this, keep pushing this a little bit further. Somebody may say, wait a minute, Hillebrand, you said God is a spirit, and a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. So if God is a spirit and hath not flesh and bones, how are we made in the image of God? You said you've been really camping on this thing about physicality, but God's a spirit. He's uh, not made, doesn't have flesh and bones. Uh, I want you to think about Jesus. Jesus, okay? Did Jesus take on human form? Yes, he did. Did he only appear as a human or was he a human? He was a human. When Jesus got killed, did he really die as a human being? He died. When he comes back to life from after he's been dead, did Jesus just rise as a spirit or did Jesus rise physically? As a matter of fact, he goes up to, what was that guy's name? He says, hey, check it out, man. Put your fingers here. 
put your fingers in my side and stuff. It's me. This is me. I was crucified. There are the marks and stuff. Do you remember doubting Thomas? Okay. So he says to Thomas, feel. By the way, did Jesus, after the resurrection, did he sit down and eat with his disciples? Like, eat food. Yeah. So was Jesus physical after the resurrection? Was the resurrection physical? Is Jesus going to be in a human body for eternity? Did Jesus raise from the dead, and is he alive forevermore in a human body? Now, my question to you is, if Jesus in the future, and it's been a couple thousand years now, if he's in a human body for eternity, is it possible that Jesus was in a human body, or like a human body, before the creation, and that we were made in the image of Christ, the physicality of that, we were made in the image of Christ? Therefore, can Christ become a human being because we're compatible? Can Jesus become a dog? We would Jesus become a dog? You know what I'm saying? Is a dog like incompatible? Okay, can he become a human being? Yes, he can, because there's compatibility there. So what I'm suggesting is that Christ from eternity had a, quote, human form, and that we as human beings were made in that image, so that when Jesus comes down, can he morph himself into a human being? Is it compatible that he can be that way the rest of eternity? Yes, he's compatible with that. Does that make sense? So I'm arguing then we actually look like God. The terms Selim and Demute are physical terms. And so what I'm suggesting is that we are made like Christ. We're made in the image of Christ. And by the way, after the fall, do we have some problems with being you know, immoral and sinful? Are we being recreated in the image of Christ? Is, is being like Christ our destiny? And so that's where we're going. So we're going back in a certain sense. The image of God is in us. It's been marred because of sin. We are going back to becoming like Christ. And so that's... Uh, Anyways, now, we're built on the image of Christ is what I'm suggesting, and then therefore there's this compatibility and things like that that work with that. Now, I want to raise a couple other things here. There's some implications to this that are really wonderful. Look in the future, 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, talks about the image going in the future. But we know that when he, that is Jesus, this is talking about Jesus, that when he appears, we shall be like him. When Jesus appears, will there be a transformation in our bodies? And we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him does what? Purifies himself. Does the hope of Christ's return purify us? Do we purify ourselves waiting for the hope of Christ? Do you know someone who has lived in light of the coming of Christ? Um, my father uh, was old. I remember him when I was young, going to the window, and he would go to the window almost on a daily basis. And he'd go to the window, he would look out the window, and he said, you know, Jesus may be coming back today. Did that shape his life? Did that shape his life? You better believe it did. Did he love my mother because Christ may be coming back today? Probably loved my mother for other reasons too, but it was a, he, did, did he love my mother? Oh yeah, yeah. Did my father try to be the best father that he could be? Because what? Christ may be coming back today and I've got to face my maker. And so you've got a really beautiful thing there that it transforms this, this hope. What I'm trying to suggest is, does hope transform who you are? Uh, let's suppose, like my wife's a CPA now. Suppose some of you guys are going to become CPAs and things. If you start to become a CPA at Gordon College and you take all these courses, will your hope of becoming a CPA, will it shape how you learn and what you learn because of your hope? You hope that you're going to be able to do something or, or have this kind of vocation or something. And so you shape your studies to that. Okay? Does hope shape who you become? Does hope shape who you become? And what he's saying is here is that when Christ comes back, we have this hope that Christ will come back. And when we see him, we will be like him. The, the image of God in us will be renewed. The image of God in us will be renewed and will be made right, will be purified, will be purified in his sight when Jesus comes back. And that, is that a big hope? This is a big hope, man. Someday we're going to see Jesus. He's going to transform us into, into his image and, and that kind of thing. Now, there's some other things here, too. Uh, C.S. Lewis's book, Weight of Glory, I think, deals with this. That Can you see the image of God in other people? Can you see the image of God in other people? Can you see the image of God in people you dislike? 
Are they made in the image of God? Can you see? Is there goodness? Is there goodness? Is God goodness embedded in every individual? In one way or another. Are, now they may be, is it possible they can be a really evil person? But are they still made in the image of God? I want to give two examples of this, and I'm going to walk over here because I want to get away from the Bible on these examples because they bring back bad memories for myself and things. Uh, once upon a time, I went to a place called Grand Island High School. There was a girl at Grand Island High School called Maxine. Maxine was, and I don't know how to say this, uh, she, was, she was like the most homely girl at Grand Island High School. It was like you didn't want to sit or be by her because you get whatever she got and you don't want that. It's like cooties or whatever it was. And so everybody was like abstain from Maxine because she's like on, on one of the untouchables kind of thing. Really homely girl. Did everybody in the school mock this girl out? Okay. And actually it was so pathetic after a while they didn't even mock her out. Okay. But nobody wanted to be around Maxine and stuff like that. Question, was Maxine made in the image of God? Yeah. To treat her like that, was that appropriate? And I wish I were a sharper... I was not. I didn't do any of the cruel stuff to Maxine and stuff like that, but I didn't do any. What should I have done as a Christian? Is it possible I should have befriended her and, and made her feel the own image of God in her and brought that out? And I was not smart enough to do that when I was a young kid, and I'm ashamed of that. It was bad. Went back to, uh, what do they call it, Union's Grand Island High School. This is like uh, many X years later, but it's many, uh, many years Kevin Carr, guy I went to my high school with, said, hey, Ted, you remember Maxine? And it was like, who can forget Maxine? There was only one Maxine in the school. Maxine's become a Christian. She's a sister in Christ now. And Kevin told that to me on the phone. It's like, holy cow, man. Christian people should, should treat people with dignity and respect. And, we, and now, let me go on to another example. Once upon a time, my wife and I went to a concert. It was a Michael Card concert. He was a guy after the Civil War who used to sing Bible songs. And so we got some free tickets because Anita was, uh, she stayed in her house all the time and she ate our food. She, she lived with us basically. She was a student and stuff. And, and so she was uh, with this uh, WDCX or so the Christian radio station. So she got free tickets. So we got to sit in the, like, uh, the, um, the, the booth with all the, the privileged people. And so it was all, you know, red, this red, uh, like, rope went off and roped off section. And so she pranced down and she lifted up the rope and we got to sit right there. And Michael Card was doing the concert here. There was a big old speaker here. My, my wife hates loud music. And I'm sitting in front of the speaker. I like it loud because I can't hear. But anyways, so I'm sitting in front of the speaker. I'm saying, this is going to be a great concert, man. He's like, I'm, we're talking 15 feet from us. And so we're sitting down there and I'm thinking, man, I'm just, this is like special seats. Whenever I go to concerts, I'm usually way in the back and I got to use binoculars, you know. So this time we're right on top of it, man. So I'm sitting there in the seats, right, basically about there, and all of a sudden this guy comes walking in, he lifts up the rope, and he sits down next to me. And I think, oh, this, is, this guy's a big shot. You know, they're all big shots down there where we were. He then proceeds to take off his shoes, and with his stocking feet, he puts his foot right here. The, there were theater seats. <laughs> Put one of his foot there, and one of his foot's there. <laughs> There's this lady, her hair's all done up. She's really just all decked out. And this lady's got this guy's two stocking feet like six inches from her nose. Either way she turns, man. Everybody starts going, whoa, this is getting a little weird. I've never seen that bad before. So anyways, Anita pops up then and she knows, okay, the guy shouldn't have been sitting there. So she runs around the thing, comes down this side. She comes in and she starts talking to the guy. Now, Anita, you'd have to know this girl's tough. Um, I don't know how to describe it. She, this girl's seen a lot of life, okay? I'm talking abuse. I'm talking a lot of major stuff, okay? Uh, she's a tough girl. She comes down, talks to the guy. I don't know what the guy said to her. And all of a sudden, she just starts backing up like this, and she walked away. And I thought, holy cow. I don't, I'd never seen her act like that before. I don't know what he said, but I'd never seen her back off like that. She's a pretty aggressive uh, young woman. So she comes back around, sits down and stuff, and then I start talking to the guy, and the guy starts telling me his story, and... Um, you know, he was in this laundromat and 40 guys jumped him. He's got a third degree black belt and he just blew all 40 guys away. And so I'm talking with this guy and my wife, meanwhile, leans over to Anita and says, it's okay, Ted, Ted talks real well with people like this. 
<laughs> and stuff. So I'm thinking, okay, 40 guys, third degree black belt. Uh, turns out my son and I were at that time working on our black belts. So I'm saying, he's third degree. Well, this should be interesting. And so anyways, he starts talking. He runs computers out of his head. He did 20 computers at a time. He doesn't use a keyboard, mouse, or anything, or even speech. He runs them out of his head, 20 computers at a time. So he's going off, and the stories are getting a little stranger and stranger. So meanwhile, intermission happens. What happens? All the people there go, pshoom, they're all gone. I stay there and talk to the guy through intermission and things. They come back and stuff. We sit down and finish the concert out. Uh, at the end of the concert, obviously, does this guy have problems? Yeah. And so I, I, st I stood up and I said, I want to feel your power. Because he was telling me all his power and stuff. So I said, I want to feel your power, man. So the guy gives me a bear hug and starts squeezing me. And I'm thinking, OK, you know, I'm figuring out how am I going to you know, do this stuff. But if it gets bad, I can take care of myself. You know, I'm a big boy and stuff. He starts squeezing me, and I said, I want to feel your power. And so he starts really squeezing down on me and stuff. And, and you know, I'm big. It's not gonna be, and, but, but, but. Then he made a mistake. He tried to pick me up. <laughs> he picks me up off the ground, and his back goes out. And he goes, oh, my back, my back, <laughs> and stuff. And just, in, just like that, all of a sudden, it was all the mythology of this grandiose thing. Boom, it was all gone. Poor dude hurt his back and stuff. I, I mean, I didn't try to do that. I mean, you know, I, but anyways. Now, now, I ask you, I ask you this question, was he made in the image of God? Yeah. yeah. Should I have treated him with dignity and respect? And the answer is yes. Okay. Did you know that night God showed me in small ways what I should be doing with my life? God used that guy to communicate his will for my life. You know, what is, what's God's will? What's God's will? That guy helped me sort that out. And what I say is I praise God for that guy. And what I'm saying is be careful. God speaks through the, you know, I've got somebody I know now, they, they're around homeless people all the time, and it's kind of like they walk around homeless people, it's, oh, yucky, all these homeless people. Do you know one of those homeless people could be Jesus? Could be an angel for all you know. And so what I'm saying is when you see people, do you look at them with dignity and respect, even though they're in the plights of life? God can use those people to speak through you and to you. And, and what I'm saying is, Treat people with honor and dignity. And um, the image of God is, by the way, is this image of God, is this a little thing or is this a big thing? This is a big thing, okay? And what I'm saying is that Christian people should allow us to connect to others, the us, across all sorts of boundaries where we look and we see the glory of God in another person. And even, by the way, is it possible that other person can't even see it in themselves? And can you bring that out? It's just, this is our gift. God has told us we are made in God's image and that we can become like God to see that image in other people, to give them the glory and dignity that they may never have had from their father, their mother, nobody. We can give them the dignity and respect that they, for being made in the image of God. It's, it's wonderful. I don't know. If, this, is, this is really important stuff. This is a big deal. People are made in the image of God, okay? So, all right, that, that's a big thing. Now, um, let me jump over one more topic we want to hit here. And, okay, the tree of life. Okay, well, let's try to go through this quickly. And um, I'll tell you what, you guys want to stand up? Why don't we run through the Bible aerobics just to get some breath in you guys and things like that? So it's okay. We got one minute Bible. No. Okay. Um, Okay, I just want to cover two trees, and we'll kind of be done for the day, but two trees here. Um, the tree of life. What is the function of this tree of life in the Garden of Eden? You have the tree of life described there. And how would they have known what the tree of life was? Would they have known what death is? Would Adam and Eve have known what death is? How would they know what life, you know, tree of life? If you understand death, then you know life is kind of the contrast to that. But if you never really experienced death, is it possible there was death before the fall into sin? Is it possible that the animals died before the sin, before the fall? Now, this is something to think about. I don't have an answer on this, but I had a professor once who spun my head with it, and I still don't know the answer. Is it possible that before the fall, by the way, did, do amoebas eat other things? You know what I'm saying? Do little critters, bacteria, do bacteria eat on stuff? Do lions eat stuff? 
before the fall, you know, the lions eat stuff and things. So, so what I'm suggesting is, is it possible that there was animal death before the fall? And that Adam and Eve knew what death was because they saw it in the animal world, though they hadn't experienced it. I don't know. Yeah, I wonder about it too. Um, I don't know. So anyways, but just put that in the back of your mind. It's possible maybe some people think that there was animal death before the fall of Adam and Eve, and that's how they would have known this and stuff. And then with the fall, you get actually human death. Yeah, did you have a question? Well, I would say you could also think of it as like death due to like Okay, so does everybody see what she's taking a different tack that's interesting? She's saying they would have known dust is the dust you shall return because you came from the dust and things. But when did that dust return? When were they told that later in chapter 3? But maybe they knew that earlier and stuff. So we have to project that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now let's uh, think about some other things here with this tree. Does Genesis 2.16 imply that they could eat of the tree of life before the fall? In Genesis 2.16 it says, let me just read this, it says, And the Lord God commanded man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden except how many? One or two? One. Okay, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Does that imply then that they could actually eat from the tree of life? Yeah, it implies that they could eat from the tree of life. They, the one tree that they couldn't eat was a tree of knowledge of good and evil. So this is interesting. And by the way, what happens when they sin? Do they get kicked out of the garden? God throws them out of the garden after they've sinned. And in chapter 3, verse 22, it says this. And the Lord said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden so they would not have access to what tree? The tree of life. So the tree of life is removed from humankind at this point when they get kicked out of the garden. Now what's really interesting to me is Revelation 22. When New Jerusalem, the last chapter of the Bible, when New Jerusalem comes down and the waters go out, guess what tree reappears in the New Jerusalem? The tree of life reappears on both sides of the river doing fruit 12 seasons. There are 12, every, basically fruit every month of the year, and the leaves were for the healing of the nations, okay? Is the tree of life still around? Somewhere, not here, but when the new Jerusalem comes down, the tree of life is there and we get to participate in it. So it's, in other words, the tree of life is still there. The book of Revelation has it. By the way, does the Bible begin with this tree of life? We're cut off from the tree of life. Do you see, does the rest of the Bible basically get us back to the tree of life? It's kind of interesting. The Bible begins and ends kind of with this tree of life thing. Now, here's three views of the tree of life, okay? Some people think that the tree of life was kind of like a magical thing. You chomp on the fruit, you live forever. You chomp on the fruit, you live forever. Does the Bible do much with magic? No. Actually, there are miracles in the Bible, but the miracles are usually, you know, there's a purpose, there's a reason it's not just magic. So this magical view, I think, is down the tubes and things. Some people think it was more like health food. It was, it was the perfect kind of food that was balanced and stuff. If you ate this tree of life, it was the perfect uh, combination of, it was like walnuts, okay? A lot of M, uh, omega-3s and stuff, and so you eat a lot of walnuts, you kind of live forever. I'm, I'm just kidding, okay? <laughs> but not really. Walnuts are good for you, but anyways, okay, perfect health food. Does it really seem the perfect health food when you're reading the Genesis context on this, the perfect now? Again, it doesn't seem that. Here's a suggestion, the one that I buy that I think is interesting. I think it was Gordon Wenham in his commentary on Genesis suggests this, this, that the, the tree of life was a sacrament. That is, the tree of life, by eating the fruit, it didn't you know, like give you the nourishment to live forever, but the tree of life was like a sacrament. When I say sacrament, what comes to your mind? Sacrament is the, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist. In the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, you take the cup, and this cup is my what? Is my blood the new covenant? Question: Is it really his blood? No, you know we're Protestants now. It's just it's it's you know you drink it. It's it's it's, it's grape juice or wine or a I've had apple juice sometimes, even Kool Aid one time. Anyways, <laughs> I don't recommend the Kool Aid stuff. Enough Kool Aid drinkers in this world. But anyways, uh, 
So anyways, the, no, but let me get back. So, so the, the cup stands for the blood of Christ. The, the, the cracker, you break the cracker, unleavened bread, you break it. This is my body, which is broken for you, that kind of thing. So the bread stands for his body, which is broken, the blood for the cup and things. So they stand for something. Now, by the way, can you violate those images? Remember in 1 Corinthians, he says, don't eat the Lord's Supper unworthily. Doesn't want the images violated. So I wonder if the tree of life stands for right life and right relationship with God and that it is taken as a sacrament. That is, now you have life with God forever. And so it's taken like a sacrament kind of thing, rather than the stuff actually nourishes your body like that to live forever, that it's, it's taken in a sacramental way. Does that, does that make sense? Again, this is hypothesis, but, but to be honest with you, I like that. It makes a lot of sense out of a lot of things. And so I, I, th I take it as sacramental and things. So, but anyways, now the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now this one's a little tricky. Um, how would Adam and Eve know what evil was? How would Adam and Eve know what evil was? If somebody has experienced only the good and never evil, what do we call that kind of a person? A person that knows only good, they've never experienced evil. What do we call that kind of a person? Blessed, right? Okay. Uh, he actually used the term down here. Did anybody use the term naive? What were you going to say? Ignorant. Okay. I want to kind of put a better face on it. I, actually, that's, that's probably what through my head too, but I want to use the word naive. Is naive a little better? Okay. In other words, the person's naive. Okay. They've never experienced evil and things, and you know that, how that goes. Okay. So what, what did evil mean for Adam and Eve before the fall? Why would God put this tree in the garden? I mean, this tree of good, knowledge of good and evil, why was it put in the garden anyway? And I've got a couple suggestions here. One is that I think choice is necessary for a moral agent. If a moral agent never makes a choice, are they really a moral agent? Right? Do you see the importance of, of, more, of making a choice? And so a choice is put there because human beings needed to make a choice. Is that one of the problems of college? Is it possible to study all sorts of things theoretically in college? Is it a very different thing to make a choice, to choose something? Very different, OK? Uh, is it possible to talk about war at Gordon College? Is it talk possible to talk about killing someone else at Gordon College in a theoretical way? Is it very different for my son to go to Afghanistan and have to decide whether he's going to pull the trigger to end somebody's life? And what I'm saying is all this college stuff kind of fades away, you know, when the actual decision to do something. And what I'm saying is be careful that you don't start thinking, because you know how to deal with things theoretically, you know life. What I'm saying is no, no, no. College is built for this, and that's good, but you've got to know when you actually make decisions in real life, it's very different. You have then consequences. You have all sorts of things going on. So be careful about college. It can go to your head sometimes, and uh, that's bad. But making choices. Do you need to make actual choices to determine your moral agency? Yes. And here's another one that I think is important in terms of choice and love. Choice and love. Did God make us so that we had to love him, or did God give us a choice? God gave us a choice. And what I'm saying is, would you like to marry somebody who was forced to marry you? They didn't have a choice. They had to marry you. OK? Would that be, do you want love someone to choose to love you? Does that choice of someone to choose to love you, does that mean a whole lot? Yes. OK? And so my guess is that God says, I'm not going to force them to love me. They get to make the choice. Will they love me or not? And what did humankind do? Now you say, I don't want to love you. Have you. By the way, has anybody ever told you that? I mean, you know, you th I think, you know, you ever go out with a girl and stuff and she, she dumps you? <laughs> uh, does that hurt? Like, bad? Hurt? Uh, have you ever been out, girl's been out with a guy and a guy just dumps the girl and stuff like that? How does that make you feel? I mean, is that, that, do those things hurt at the core of your being? Now, God basically is told by man, what? Hey, we don't want you. We're going to choose our own way and stuff. And so you get a question, does that hurt God? By the way, does the Bible describe God being hurt like that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Isaiah chapter 1. Uh, Hosea. Oh, man. Ezekiel. Ezekiel's the worst. Ezekiel 16. God describes his own hurt at feeling rejected by Israel, having helped them and helped them and nurtured them and loved them, and all they do is kick them between the legs. 
okay? And that's kind of the, some of the imagery there. So choice and love seem to be involved. Now, does the, spur, does the serpent speak the truth? What I'm going to suggest to you is that the serpent speaks the truth. The serpent speaks the truth. Now, you say, wait a minute, Hildebrand. Well, let's me read this. It says, now the serpent, chapter 3, Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 and following. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord had made. The word crafty can be translated shrewd. I like shrewd better. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said, for God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be open. Question, when they ate it, there, does it say that their eyes were open? Yes, it does. Is Satan telling the truth? Yes, the serpent's telling the truth. Let me finish this, okay? Your eyes will be open, and you will be like God. Does God, in verse 22, said, in verse, chapter 3, verse 22, God said, the man has now become like one of us. Your eyes will be opened. You'll become like God, is Satan, and you will know good and evil. God says, man has now become like us, knowing good and evil. Does Satan tell the truth? Let me just tell you a story. Once upon a time, my daughter was played basketball in sixth grade. She played with this other girl. This other girl lied all the time. No, seriously. She lied to everybody about things that didn't even matter. Did everybody in the school know that this girl was a liar? Everybody knew it. Question, did she ever fake anybody out or did everybody expect her to lie? Everybody expected it out of her. The only person she really fooled was whom? Or was who? Herself. She had herself. She thought she had everybody faked out. Everybody knew what she was up to. Is Satan always a liar? Does Satan quote scripture? When Satan comes after Jesus in the temptation in the wilderness, does Satan quote scripture? He takes Christ up to the pinnacle, says, throw yourself down. Psalm says his angels will bear you up. Satan is quoting scripture. Are scriptures true? Yes. Does Satan speak the truth? Now, let me just tell you a secret about rat poison. Sorry. Um, when you put out rat poison, you put it in good hamburger. Now, is that hamburger good hamburger that you could eat? And 99% of it is good hamburger. But what's the problem? It's 1% poison. The rat eats it, and what gets it? the 1%. The other 99%, is that good, healthy hamburger? Yes. Okay, what I'm saying is, a person that tells the truth, tells the truth, tells the truth, and with a small lie in question, is that the one that fools? With Satan, he tells the truth, the truth, the truth. Question, in the midst of the truth, does he have embedded a wicked lie that will destroy them? So what I'm saying is, be careful. What I'm saying is this, is Satan an angel of light, or is he dark Vader that's always evil? Is Satan an angel of light? Does he deceive people? Does he deceive people by telling them the truth, but then amidst that truth is embedded this lie? And so I'm saying, is Satan really subtle, shrewd, and tricky? Yes, very evil. Because what happens is he, he garbs himself in things like the truth. He guards himself in things like righteousness, goodness, and all those things. But in the inside, there's this thing that's devastating. So the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Satan comes in this positive way. And then, actually, I'll tell you what we'll do this next time about how did Adam and Eve become more like God by knowing in their experience of evil? And then, in one sense, how did they get destroyed by it? So we'll look at that next time and things. So take care. We'll see you on Thursday. This is Dr. Ted Hildebrand teaching Old Testament history, literature, and theology, lecture number six on genealogy not equal to chronology, the image of God, and the two trees in the Garden of Eden. Dr. Hildebrandt.